Theistic Evolution Critique, C.S. Lewis on Evolution. We've been studying the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Um, before we begin, I will point out something that is pointed out in the introduction. Um, there are several ways to relate God's activity to the world as in which we see it. Uh, some of them that are listed a young life creationism of various stripes. There is uh, what is sometimes called old earth creationism, but it's really better called old life creation. There is intelligent design friendly theistic evolution, which we'll see a lot of today. There is intelligent design unfriendly theistic evolution. Not that God couldn't intervene, but that if he does, you can't tell. And finally, of course, there is atheistic evolution, which says God doesn't intervene because God doesn't exist. The book that we're looking at is specifically designed to deal with not atheistic evolution, although it does deal with that to some extent, but intelligent design unfriendly theistic evolution. That is to say, God's there, he did it, we won't argue too much about exactly how, but what we can tell you is that if you look at it, you can't tell that God did it. This chapter is by John West, who's a C.S. Lewis scholar. It's in section two, it's the last chapter of section two, the philosophical critique of theistic evolution. And it's entitled Darwin in the Dock, C.S. Lewis on evolution. Some of you will recognize Darwin in the Dock being a play on God in the Dock as one of C.S. Lewis's books. The summary of the chapter says, few 20th century writers are as beloved by modern Christians as C.S. Lewis. In recent years, there has been considerable discussion about the views of Lewis on evolution, with some claiming that he is best described as a proponent of theistic evolution. This chapter, drawing on Lewis's public and private writings, show that Lewis, in fact, expressed deep and growing concerns about major aspects of modern evolutionary theory. Lewis did not object in principle to the evolutionary idea of common descent, but he sharply limited its application in a way that mainstream proponents of evolution would find unacceptable. More importantly, Lewis was a thoroughgoing skeptic of the creative power of unguided Darwinian natural selection, and he sharply criticized the application of what he called evolutionism to morality and society. Finally, Lewis validated raising questions about Darwinian evolution by showing how science itself depends on many uh, non-scientific assumptions. It's interesting to ask the question, what would Lewis do uh, uh, if he had lived another 30 years? Few 20th century writers are as beloved by modern Christians as C.S. Lewis. Through his works of fiction like the Chronicles of Narnia and nonfiction books like Mere Christianity, Lewis continues to shape in profound ways the faith of millions of people around the globe. Given his prominence, it is understandable why so many Christians want to know about Lewis's view on evolution. Lewis has been treated in recent years as a virtual patron saint by certain proponents of theistic evolution. In his best-selling book, The Language of God, Biologist Francis Collins invoked Lewis to defend the idea that Christians should accept the animal ancestry of humans. In the journal Perspectives on, Christian, on Science and Christian Faith, Michael Peterson of Asbury Theological Seminary went considerably further. According to Peterson, Lewis not only embraced both cosmic and biological evolution as highly confirmed scientific theories, but he would have rejected out of hand arguments offered by modern proponents of intelligent design. Peterson's article on Lewis and evolution was serialized online by the pro-theistic evolution group Biologos. There is little doubt that Lewis was interested in the topic of evolution. He studied it repeatedly in his books and essays. He wrote about it in his private letters and his personal library contained more than a dozen books and pamphlets focused on evolution some of which were marked up with extensive underlining and annotations, including his personal copy of Charles Darwin's autobiography. However, to accurately determine Lewis's real views on evolution, we first need to untangle the distinct ways in which Lewis employed the term. 
one of the most challenging things about discussing evolution today is that the term is so elastic. And we've seen that before. Lewis addressed at least three different kinds of evolution in his writing. Evolution as a theory of common descent. Evolution as a theory of unguided natural selection acting on random variations, otherwise known as Darwinism. And evolution as a cosmic philosophy, or evolutionism. Lewis did not object in principle to evolution in the first sense, common descent, although he sharply limited its application in a way that mainstream proponents of evolution would find unacceptable. The case for Lewis as a supporter of evolution in the second sense, Darwinism, is almost non-existent. Lewis was a thoroughgoing skeptic of the creative power of unguided natural selection. As for evolution in the third sense, evolutionism, Lewis respected the poetry and grandeur of what he sometimes called the myth of evolution, but he certainly regarded it as untrue. Lewis's limited acceptance of common descent. Common descent is the claim that all organisms currently living have descended from one or a few original ancestors through a process Darwin called descent with modification. According to this idea, not only humans and apes share an ancestor, but so do humans, clams, and fungi, and oak trees. Lewis clearly believed that Christians can accept evolution as common descent without doing violence to their faith. This is what Lewis was getting at when he wrote to evolution critic Bernard Ackworth, I believe that Christianity can still be believed even if evolution is true. We'll read that uh, a little more extensively later. In Lewis's view, whether God used common descent to create the first human beings was irrelevant to the truth of Christianity. As he wrote to one correspondent later in his life, I don't mind whether God man made man out of earth or whether earth merely means previous millennia of ancestral organisms. If the fossils make it prob probable that man's physical ancestors evolved, no matter. In the problem of pain, Lewis even offers a possible evolutionary account of the development of human beings, although he makes clear he is offering speculation, not history. If it is legitimate to guess, he writes, I offer the following picture, a myth in the Socratic sense, which he decides, defines as a not unlikely tale or an account of what may have been the historical fact. And the emphasis there is in the original. Lewis then suggests that for long centuries God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity in the image of himself. The creature may have existed for ages before it became man. Nonetheless, Lewis did not go out of his way to champion the abnormal ancestry of humans. When pressed on the subject by evolution critic Bernard Ackworth in the 1940s, Lewis backpedaled, replying that his belief that men in general have immortal and rational souls does not oblige or qualify me to hold a theory of their pre-human organic history if they have one, saying they may not have. A few years later, Lewis relished the exposure of Piltdown Man as a hoax. Originally touted as evidence for the long-sought missing link between apes and humans, the Piltdown Man skull was discovered in the 1950s to be a fake. We'll read that letter in, in, uh, later on. Lewis wrote to Bernard Ackworth that although he didn't think the scandal should be exploited, quote, I can't help sharing a sort of glee with you about the explosion of poor old Piltdown. One inevitably feels what fun it would be if this were only the beginning of a landslide. Whatever Lewis's final position on the animal ancestry of the human race, it would be wrong to conclude that his acceptance of some kind of human evolution placed him in the camp of mainstream evolutionary biology or even a mainstream theistic evolution. In fact, Lewis insisted on three huge exceptions to evolutionary explanations of humanity that placed him well outside evolutionary orthodoxy both then and now. Historic fall. Lewis's first exception to human evolution was his insistence on an actual fall of mankind from an original state of innocence. In Christian theology, God originally created human beings morally innocent. Those first free humans then freely rejected God's will for them, resulting in a fall from innocence and harmony into the sinful condition of the human race as we currently find it. According to historic Christian teaching, not only human beings, but the entire creation was tainted by man's initial act of wrongdoing. It was to reverse the impact of the fall that God became incarnate to save us from our sins. Thus, the fall provides the necessary backstory for Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. 
Leading theistic evolutionists, no less than secular evolutionists, insist that a historic fall is incompatible with mainstream evolutionary theory. In the words of Episcopalian Bishop John Shelby Spong, Darwin destroyed the primary myth by which we had told the Jesus story for centuries. Post-Darwin, there was no perfect human life which then corrupted itself and fell into sin. And so the story of Jesus who comes to rescue us from the fall becomes a nonsensical story. Now, Spong is well known for his theological liberalism, but even in evangelical Christians we have, for example, Carl Giberson in Saving Darwin, including a section titled Dissolving the Fall. Human beings were sinful from the very start because the evolutionary process is based on selfishness, which I would agree with. Evangelical Francis Collins wrote an enthusiastic foreword to Giberson's book. Lewis observed, on the other hand, that it was not yet obvious to him that all theories of evolution do contradict the fall, but he was emphatic that any evolutionary theory that does deny a real fall is unacceptable. I believe that man has fallen from the state of innocence in which he was created. I therefore disbelieve in any theory which contradicts this. Accordingly, Lewis was careful in the problem of pain to preserve a historical fall as part of his hypothetical account of human evolution. Indeed, he titled the chapter in which his evolutionary account appears, The Fall of Man. And at the end of that chapter, he declares that the thesis of this chapter is simply that man as a species spoiled himself. Following traditional Christian teachings, Lewis emphasized that the first humans prior to the fall were morally good, had unimpeded fellowship with God, and lived in a paradise. Lewis had little patience for those evolutionists, theistic or otherwise, who asserted that modern science made it impossible to believe in man's original paradisal state and subsequent fall. At the heart of their assertions in Lewis's view was what he called the idolatry of artifacts, the assumption that we can dis discern the morality or intelligence of ancient people from their material products, and of course the material products that are left after thousands of years. Um, Lewis pointed out that pottery shards or spearheads might expose the primitive state of a prehistoric people's technology, but they do not reveal the state of the people's morality or even their native intelligence. If Lewis dismissed the claims that science refuted the fall, he was equally skeptical of efforts to reinterpret the fall to make it part of evolutionary history. In the standard evolutionary picture, popularized by Darwin himself in The Descent of Man, human beings started out as brutes and gained morality and religion only after a long struggle for survival. Given this view of the development of human beings, it is hardly surprising that some theistic evolutionists have concluded that if there was a fall in evolutionary history, it must have been a fall upward into greater maturity and responsibility of the sort advocated by liberal theologians since Hegel and Kant. For example, contemporary Christian thinker Brian McLaren, and I uh, won't bother to quote too much of that, McLaren does acknowledge that the ascent of man is marked by struggles with sin, but he seems to believe that human wrongdoing is a natural part of God's plan to bring about human maturity. Lewis spent much of his novel Paralandra in 1943 critiquing this kind of thinking, arguing that God intended for human beings to progress to self-knowledge and maturity by obedience not rebellion. Four years later in his book Miracles in 1947, uh, Lewis ridiculed those who say that the story of the fall in Genesis, Genesis is not literal and then go on to say, I have heard them myself, that it really was a fall upwards. Which is like saying that because my heart is broken contains a metaphor, it therefore means I feel very cheerful. This mode of interpretation I regard frankly as nonsense. Lewis continued to defend the reality of the fall to those who corresponded with him. To one correspondent who questioned the grounds of Lewis' belief that the earliest humans lived unfallen in a paradise-like state, Lewis replied tartly, You do know very well what grounds I have for assuming the existence of paradisal man, namely that it is part of Orthodox Christianity. A literal Adam. Lewis not only believed in a historic fall, he also embraced the literal existence of Adam and Eve, which was another important exception to his acquiescence to human evolution. Lewis's acceptance of a historical Adam and Eve is widely unrecognized today. Popular Christian pastor Tim Keller, for example, writes that C.S. Lewis did not believe in a literal Adam and Eve. Um, while US, Lewis was still a young atheist in the 1920s, he certainly disbelieved in Adam and Eve, although he was simultaneously skeptical of Orthodox Darwinism. 
By the 1940s, however, he was publicly noncommittal, writing in The Problem of Pain that we do not know how many of these unfallen creatures God made or how long they continued in the paradisal state, but presumably there could have been just two. In private, he was not so reticent. In a discussion at his home attended by Oxford colleague Helen Gardner, Lewis stated that the person from history he would most likely most like to meet in heaven was Adam. And Gardner protested that if there really was a historically someone whom we could name as the first man, he would be a Neanderthal ape-like figure whose conversation she could not conceive of finding interesting. Lewis is said to have responded with disdain, I see, we have a Darwinist in our midst. It is worth noting that throughout Lewis's imaginative works, Adam and Eve are typically treated as real figures from history, not as allegories or myths, even when the characters in Lewis's stories are seeking to explain truths about the real world. In the Narnian Chronicles, human beings are repeatedly referred to as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. And during Lewis's telling of a temptation story on another planet in Paralandra, uh, Venus to be specific, the hero repeatedly affirms the teachings of traditional theology to the planet's equivalent of Eve, including a traditional account of Adam and Eve. Additionally, Lewis treated Adam as a real person in history in his private correspondence. He described his novel Paralandra as a working out of the supposition that what had happened to Adam and Eve on Earth could happen to another first couple elsewhere. Suppose even now in some other planet there were a first couple undergoing the same temptation that Adam and Eve underwent here, but successfully. And if you read Paralandra, you'll recognize that. A mindless process could not produce man. This is number three. Lewis's final exception to human evolution was his insistence that the development of human beings required far more than a mindless material process. In his own words, his speculations about human evolution had pictured Adam as being physically the son of two anthropoids on whom, after birth, God worked the miracle which made him man. In Lewis's view, Darwinian evolution might possibly explain, explain man's physical form, but it could not explain man's mind, his morality, or his eternal soul. Modern Darwinism uh, Lewis was deeply skeptical about what su such a mindless mechanism could actually achieve. Lewis's doubts about the creative power of natural selection. Lewis knew that the truly momentous features of modern evolutionary theory is its insistence that life is the product of an unguided process. This claim that evolution is a product of chance and necessity forms the core of orthodox Darwinian theory. Darwin himself repeatedly made clear that evolution by natural selection neither required nor involved intelligent guidance. And I'm going to skip the quote of Darwin because I'm sure you all know that. The dominant view of the evolution today in the scientific community remains essentially Darwinian, and again, you don't really need proof of that. One certainly can conceive of a theory of guided evolution, but mainstream Darwinism theory is not it. But can such a fundamentally mindless and undirected process create the exquisite form and function seen throughout the natural world? Lewis didn't think so. He did affirm that within, with Darwinianism, as a theory in, bio theorem in biology, I do not think a Christian need have any quarrel. But for Lewis, Darwinian Darwinianism as a theory in, bio in biology was a pretty modest affair. Contra leading evolutionists, Lewis thought Darwinism does not in itself explain the origin of organic life nor of the variations, nor does it discuss the origin and validity of reason. So what can the Darwinian mechanism explain according to Lewis? Granted that we now have minds we can trust, granted that organic life came to exist, it tries to explain, say, how species that once had wings came to lose them. That doesn't sound like quite a It explains this by the negative effects of environment operating on small variations. In other words, Darwin's theory explains how a species can change over time by losing functional features it already has. Sounds more like devolution. Suffice it to say, this is not the key thing that modern biological theory of evolution purports to explain. Natural selection can knock out a wing, but it can build a wing in the first place. Lewis didn't seem to think so. A further indication of Lewis's skepticism about the creative power of natural selection appeared, appears in a talk he delivered to the Oxford University Socratic Society in 1944. 
There Lewis stated that the Bergsonian critique of orthodox Darwinism is not easy to answer. We'll read that in context a little later. Lewis was referring to Henry Bergson, a French natural philosopher and Nobel laureate who offered a decidedly non-Darwinian account of evolution in his book, I won't try the French, Creative Evolution. The impact of Bergson on Lewis is indicated in Lewis's 1917 copy of Creative Evolution, which is filled with careful annotations and underlining on most of its nearly 400 pages. Bergson was an unsparing critic of, creative of the creative power of Darwinian natural selection. Bergson stressed that Darwinism's reliance on accidental variations as a raw material for evolution made the development of highly coordinated and complex features found in biology nothing short of incredible. And shades of uh, uh, irreducible complexity, no? From the extensive annotations Lewis made in his personal copy of Creative Evolution, it is clear that he understood and appreciated Bergson's critique of natural selection. Lewis aptly summarized the Darwinian mechanism of adaptation, according to Bergson, as the elimination of the unfit, and noted that it plainly cannot account for complicated and similarities on divergent lines of evolution. Lewis also noted Bergson's view that pure Darwinia Darwinism has to lean on a marvelous series of accidents and how Darwinists try to escape this truth by a bad metaphor. Lewis paid particular attention to Bergson's critique of Darwinian accounts of eye evolution in mollusks and vertebrates, concluding that natural selection fails to explain these eyes. Bergson's critique of natural selection likely paved the way for Lewis's doubts about Darwin and may have helped to explain a comment he wrote to his father in 1925, this is before his conversion, I think, that Darwin and Spencer stand themselves on a foundation of sand. Lewis's skepticism toward natural selection also drew inspiration from G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man, in which, which Lewis read for the first time in the mid-1920s. Near the end of his life, Lewis placed The Everlasting Man on a list of 10 books that did the most to shape his vocational attitude and philosophy of life. In chapter two of The Everlasting Man, Professors and Prehistoric Men, Chesterton skewered the pretensions of anthropologists who spun detailed theories about the culture and capabilities of primitive man based on a few flints and bones, likely inspiring Lewis's discussion of the idolatry of artifacts, which we've heard before, in The Problem of Pain. Chesterton also provided in his book a full-throttled um, argument as to why Darwinism cannot explain the higher capabilities of human beings. In Chesterton's words, man is not merely an evolution, but rather a revolution, whose rational faculties far outstrip those seen in the other animals. Chesterton's book prepared the ground for Lewis's own eventual critique of natural selection with regard to humans, as did a lesser known volume, Theism and Humanism, by Sir Alfred Arthur Balfour, best remembered today as the British Prime Minister who issued the Balfour Declaration, saying that Jews needed a homeland in Palestine. Um, Balfour adapted theism and humanism from the Gifford Lectures he had presented at the University of Glasgow in 1914. Balfour's goal was to show his audience that if we would maintain the value of our highest beliefs and emotions, we must find for them a congruous origin. Beauty must be more than an accident. The source of morality must be moral. The source of knowledge must be rational. Balfour thought that once this argument be granted, you rule out mechanism, you rule out naturalism, you rule out agnosticism, and a lofty form of theism becomes, as I think, inevitable. With regard to the human mind, Balfour argued that any effort to explain mind in terms of blind material causes was self-refuting. All creeds which refuse to see an intelligent purpose behind the unthinking power of material nature are intrinsically coherent, incoherent. In the order of causation, they base reason upon unreason. In the order of logic, they involve conclusions which discredit their own premises. Balfour offered a similar critique of materialistic accounts of human morality, which he thought destroyed morality by depicting it as a product of processes that are essentially non-moral. Balfour took special aim throughout his book at Darwinian explanations of mind and morals. Balfour in Theism and Humanism, uh, Lewis later included this book on the list of books that have influenced his philosophy of life the most, 
and its basic arguments are in prominent view in, miracle, in Lewis's Miracles, a preliminary study. As Paul Ford points out, the thesis and even the language of Balfour's first Gifford lectures permeates the first five chapters of Miracles. The revised 1960 edition of Miracles is generally recognized as presenting Lewis's most mature critique of the ability of naturalism or materialism to account for man's rational faculties. What is less noticed is the challenge Lewis's book raises for Darwinian evolution in particular. In the words of Lewis, naturalists argue that the type of mental behavior we now call rational thinking or inference must have evolved, must have been evolved by natural selection by the gradual weeding out of types less fitted to survive. Lewis flatly denied that such a Darwinian process could have produced human rationality. Natural selection could operate only by limiting responses that were biologically hurtful and multiplying those which tended to survival. But it is not conceivable that any improvement of responses could ever turn them into acts of insight or even remotely tend to do so. This is because the relationship, the relation between response and stim uh, stimulus is utterly different from that between knowledge and the truth known. Natural selection could improve our responses to stimuli from the standpoint of physical survival without ever turning them into reasoned responses. Following Balfour, Lewis went on to argue that attributing to the development of human reasoning non to a non-rational process like natural selection ends up undermining our confidence in reason itself. After all, if reason is merely an unintended byproduct of fundamentally non-rational processes, what ground do we have left for regarding its conclusions? as objectively true. And you will notice echoes of Balfour in that argument. Skipping over a bunch, the preliminary process within nature which led to the human mind, if there were any, and there may not have been, were designed to do so. In short, if an evolutionary process did produce the human mind, it was not Darwinian evolution. It was an evolution by intelligent design. At least that's West's opinion. I think I would have to agree with him. Just as Lewis in Miracles rejected a Darwinian explanation for the human mind because it undermined the validity of reason, he rejected a Darwinian account of morality because it would undermine the authority of morality by attributing it to an essentially amoral process of survival of the fittest. As a practical matter, Lewis questioned whether Darwinism could actually explain the development of key human moral traits such as friendship or romantic love. But in Miracles, he made a more fundamental point. A Darwinian process may or may not explain why men do, in fact, make moral judgments. It does not explain how they could be right in making them. It excludes, indeed, the very possibility of their being right. According to Lewis, by attributing our moral beliefs and practices completely to mindless and non-moral causes, Darwinists undermine the belief that moral standards are something objectively true, or even the belief that some moral beliefs are objectively preferable over others. After all, if human behaviors and beliefs are ultimately the products of natural selection, then all such behaviors and beliefs must be equally preferable. The same Darwinian processes that produce the material in, maternal instinct also produces infanticide. The same Darwinian process that generates love also brings forth sadism. Hence, the logical result of a Darwinian account of morality is not so much immorality as relativism or you might say amorality. According to Lewis, the person who offers such an account of morality should honestly admit that there is no such thing as right, wrong and right. No moral judgments can be true or correct, and consequently, no one system of morality can be better or worse than another. And I suppose that would include Nazi morality. This shows why it would be so misleading to classify Lewis is a theistic evolutionist, at least according to how that term is typically used today. Theistic evolution can mean many things, including a form of guided evolution, but many contemporary proponents of theistic evolution are more accurately described as theistic Darwinists. That is, they do not merely advocate a guided form of common descent, but they are attempting to combine evolution as an undirected Darwinian process with Christian theism. Although they believe in God, they strenuously want to avoid stating that God actually guided biological development, and there's some examples that are listed. In short, many modern theistic evolutionists want to retain a belief in a creator without actually affirming the guidance of that creator in the history of life. Oh, and those are all my, I just missed turning them green. Those are all my ellipses. 
Um, Lewis was familiar with attempts in his own day to imbue blind evolution with some sort of purposiveness while still denying the operation of guiding intelligence. In mere Christianity, Lewis dissected this supposed third way between outright materialism and a history of life guided by design and found it wanting. People who hold this view say that the small variations by which life on this planet evolved from the lowest form to man were not due to chance but to the striving or purposiveness of a life force. When people say this, we must ask them whether by life force they mean something with a mind or not. If they do, then a mind bringing life into existence and leading it to perfection is really a god, and their view is thus identical with the religious. If they do not, then what is the sense in saying that something without a mind strives or has purposes? This seems to me fatal to their view. In his novel Paralandra, Lewis satirized the incoherence of the emergent evolution view, which he assigned to the villain of the story, Professor E.R. Weston, a scientist run mad. Lewis gave Weston a speech of non sequiturs in mumbo jumbo where he solemnly appealed to quote, the unconsciously purposive dynamism, end quote, and the majestic spectacle of this blind, inarticulate purposiveness thrusting its way ever upward in an endless unity of differentiated, unity of differentiated achievements, whatever, towards an ever-increasing complexity of organization towards spontaneity and spirituality. Weston ultimately identified this blind and unconscious purposiveness with what he called the religious view of life and even with the Holy Spirit. The hero of the story, Dr. Elwin Ransom, was not impressed. I don't know much about what people call the religious view of life, he replied. You see, I'm a Christian, and what we mean by the Holy Ghost is not a blind, inarticulate purposiveness. Near the end of his life, Lewis read prominent theistic evolutionist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's posthumously published book, The Phenomenon of Man, which proposed yet another kind of emergent evolution. Lewis filled his copy of the books with critical annotations such as, yes, he is quite ignorant, and a radically bad book. In letters to others, Lewis called a Teilhard de Chardin's book both commonplace and horrifying, and he derided Teilhard, uh, Teilhard de Chardin's position as pantheistic, pantheistic biolatrous waffle and evolution run mad. <coughs> Skip over his other comments on Chardin because they're much the same. Lewis's criti critique of evolutionism in addition to limiting his acceptance of common descent and critiquing the power of unguided natural selection, Lewis throughout his life attacked what he called evolutionism or the myth of evolution. This was evolution as a materialistic creation story that provided a competing narrative to trad traditional monotheism. Purporting to embody the discoveries of modern science, this myth teaches that the cosmos was preceded by the infinite void and matter endlessly, aimlessly moving to bring forth it knows not what. Then by some tragic millionth, millionth chance, what tragic irony, the conditions at one point of space and time bubble up into that tiny fermentation which we call organic life. Against the hostility of nature and without purposeful direction or design, life spreads, it breeds, it complicates itself from the amoeba up to the reptile, up to the mammal. Finally, there comes forth a little naked, shivering, cowering biped shuffling not yet fully erect, promising nothing, the product of another millionth millionth chance. His name in this myth is man. Eventually he has become true man. He learns to master nature. Science arises and dissipates the superstitions of his infancy. More and more he becomes the controller of his own fate. Finally mankind becomes a race of demigods with the assistance of Darwinian eugenics, psychoanalysis, and economics, then the old enemy, nature, returns with a vengeance. The sun cools, and life is banished without hope of return from every cubic inch of infinite space. All ends in nothingness. I grew up believing this myth, and I have felt, I still feel, it's almost perfect grandeur, observes Lewis rather wistfully. Let no one say we are an unimaginative race. Neither the Greeks nor the Norsemen ever invented a better story. For Lewis, the problem with this myth is not that it does not appeal to the imagination, but that is all, it is all imagination and no logic. In fact, it contradicts the very foundation of the scientific worldview it claims to espouse. Skipping over a little bit, uh, Lewis distinguished cosmic evolution from the science of evolution 
And he initially attributed it to the distortions of popularizers and journalists rather than scientists themselves. However, Lewis eventually came to better understand just how intertwined evolution as a scientific theory was with what he had called evolutionism. Much of his growing awareness was likely due to his 16-year correspondence with Bernard Ackworth, a leader of Britain's evolution protest movement. Starting in the mid-1940s, Ackworth began sending Lewis books and essays critical of Darwin's theory, material which Lewis read and retained for his private library. We'll see some of those letters. Soon after coming in contact with Ackward, Lewis drew attention to a comment made by evolutionary zoologist David Watson that seemed to expose the dogmatism driving the beliefs of prominent evolutionary scientists. Evolution, declared Watson, is accepted by zoologists not because it has been observed to occur or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. Lewis drew this quote from an article written by two of Ackworth's colleagues in the evolutionary protest movement. Lewis found Watson's comment disquieting. Nevertheless, he still trusted that most biologists have a more robust belief in evolution than Professor Watson. Otherwise, it would mean that the sole ground for believing evolution is not empirical but metaphysical, the dogma of an amateur metaphys metaphysician who finds special creation incredible. But I do not think it has really come to that. By 1951, Lewis was not so sure. Ackworth sent him a len lengthy manuscript critical of evolution, and Lewis wrote back that he had read nearly the whole of it. Ackworth's manuscript hit home. I must confess it has shaken me, Lewis wrote. Not in my belief in evolution, which was of the vaguest and most intermittent kind, but in my belief that the question was wholly unimportant. Lewis added that the most telling point for him was the dogmatism of the evolutionary scientist cited by Ackworth. What inclines me now to think, uh, to think that you may be right in regarding it, that is evolution, as a central and radical line, the whole web of falsehood that now governs our lives is not so much your arguments against it as the fanatical and twisted attitudes of its defenders. Lewis had a sharply different view of, science, of what science should look, be like, and he made clear that knee-jerk orthodoxy was not part of it. In Lewis's view, there was nothing anti-science about questioning dogmatic claims made in the name of science. As he came to appreciate even more deeply in the final years of his life, the scientific enterprise required, requires humility and an open mind in order to prosper. Lewis's most important legacy for the evolution debate. At the root of Lewis's willing to question evolutionary claims was a healthy skepticism of the scientific enterprise itself. Lewis respected modern science, and he respected modern scientists, but unlike many contemporary champions of evolution, he did not embrace a simple-minded view of natural science as fundamentally more authoritative or less prone to error than all other fields of human endeavor. One of the last books about science Lewis read before he died was The Open Society and Its Enemies by philosopher Karl Popper. Near the end of that book, Popper frankly admits the lack of objectivity to be found even in experimental science. Lewis underlined the passage. For even our experimental and observational experience does not consist of data. Rather, it consists of a web of guesses, of conjectures, expectations, hypotheses, with which there are interwoven accepted traditional scientific and unscientific lore and prejudice. There simply is no such thing as pure uh, experimental and observational experience, experience untainted, untainted by expectation and theory. Lewis's growing awareness of the human fallibility of science was expressed powerfully in his final book, The Discarded Image, in 1964. Published after his death, the book is ostensibly about the medieval worldview, but the nature of science is one of the underlying themes. Lewis argues in the book that scientific theories are supposals and should not be confused with facts. Properly speaking, scientific theories try to account for as many facts as possible with as few assumptions as possible. But according to Lewis, we must always recognize that such explanations can be wrong. In every age, it will be apparent to accurate thinkers that scientific theories being arrived at in the way I have described are never statements of fact. They can never be more than provisional, and they have to be abandoned if someone thinks of a supposal that can account for observed phenomena with still fewer assumptions, or if we discover new phenomena that the previous theory cannot account for at all. The truly radical part of Lewis's critique of modern science was still to come. In his epilogue to the discarded image, Lewis discussed at length 
the shift from medieval to the modern mo model of biology. It soon becomes evident that he does not think empirical evidence drives scientific revolutions, at least not this one. Lewis declared that the Darwinian revolution in particular was certainly not brought about by the discovery of new facts. Lewis recalled that when he was young, he believed that Darwin discovered evolution and that the far more general radical and even cosmic developmentalism was a superstructure raised on the biological theorem. This view has been sufficiently disproved. What really happened, according to Lewis, was that the demand for a developing world, a demand obviously in harmony both with the revolutionary and the romantic temper, had developed first. And when it was full grown, the scientists went to work and discovered the evidence on which our belief in that sort of universe would now be held to rest. Lewis's view had momentous implications for how we view the reigning paradigms in science at any given time, including Darwinian evolution. We can no longer dismiss the change of models in science as a simple progress from error to truth, argued Lewis. No model is a catalog of ultimate realities, and none is a mere fantasy. But each reflects the prevalent psychology of an age almost as much as it reflects the state of that age's knowledge. Lewis added that he did not at all mean that these new phenomena are illusory, but nature gives most of her evidence in answer to the questions we ask her. Uh, the uh, chapter goes on to discuss cultural attitudes, vestigial organs, junk DNA, none of which, of course, Lewis knew about. Non-protein uh, non coding DNA performs a wide variety of functions, as Lewis pointed out so perceptively, treating reigning paradigms in science as all-encompassing dogmas will blind us to how much about nature we may be missing. Such dogmatism also breeds a kind of scientific authoritarianism that is incompatible with a free society, which Lewis eloquently rebuked in books such as The Abolition of Man and That Hideous Strength. By highlighting the all-too-human frailties of modern science, Lewis made his most important contribution to the evolution debate. In essence, he legitimized the right to dissent from Darwin. By stressing the non-scientific underpinnings of scientific revolutions, Lewis showed that Darwinian evolution should not be privileged as some special form of knowledge that is immune from critical scrutiny. By exposing just how limited a window on reality a given scientific theory can provide, he did not merely, merely validate the questioning of Darwinian evolution. He showed why such questioning was essential for the continued progress of science. And that's the end of the chapter. Um, my comments, John West seems to have mostly captured the uh, attitude of C.S. Lewis towards evolution fairly well. Evolution has changed, he agreed with. Evolution is a historical pattern. He agreed with initially, although uh, you catch reservations on that. Evolution is a mechanism that could dispense with God, he had marked doubts about. And evolution as grand myth, he felt to be totally inadequate. Now, initially, he felt that the theory was separate from the myth, and although he rejected the myth before he became a Christian even, he found himself acquiescing in the theory which he believed to be well-supported scientifically because that's what all the authorities said. But he was temperamentally very comfortable with the miraculous, and it shows both in the trilogy, that's the uh, uh, Paralandra, uh, out of the silent planet Paralandra and that hideous strength, and in the Narnia Chronicles. Lewis was clearly not a biblical literalist, and I'll just give you a, a piece of uh, something he wrote in 1944 called the Is Theology po uh, Poetry. And for those of you who want to read it without uh, finding the uh, uh, without finding the book itself, it's on the internet now. The earliest stratum of the Old Testament contains many truths in a form which I take to be legendary or even mythical. Hanging in the clouds, but gradually the truth condenses, becomes more and more historical. From things like Noah's Ark or the sun standing still upon Agilon, you come down, it's actually the moon that stood still in Agilon, but whatever. You come down to the court memoirs of King David. Finally, you reach the New Testament and history reigns supreme and the truth is incarnate. So you can see, you know, he didn't take the flood very literally. The Bergsonian critique of Orthodox Darwinism is, uh, this is moving on to a, a section that you've seen pieces of, but I want you to see the whole thing together. The Bergsonian critique of Orthodox Darwinism is not easy to answer. 
more disquieting still is Professor D.M.S. Watson's defense. Evolution in itself, he wrote, is accepted by a zoologist not because it has been observed to occur or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. This is just one place he qu he's quoted this a couple of places. Has it come to that? Does the whole vast structure of modern naturalism depend not on positive evidence but simply on a priori metaphysical prejudice? Was it devised not to get in facts but to keep out God? Even, however, if evolution in the strict biological sense has some better grounds than Professor Watson suggests, and I can't help thinking that it must, this is 1944, so he's, he's thinking evolution is probably true uh, and is not just anti-God. We should distinguish evolution in this sen strict sense from what may be called the universal evolution of evolutionism of modern thought. By universal evolutionism, I mean the belief that the very formula of universal process is from imperfect to perfect, from small beginnings to great endings, from rudimentary to the elaborate, the belief which makes people find it natural to think immorality springs from savage taboos, and you can kind of make up the rest. It, there's a whole list of things. Now, uh, in The Funeral of a Great Myth, which is in Christian Reflections, uh, and unfortunately, I don't know if we can find that one on the internet. Maybe you can. Um, I am not in the least denying that organisms on this planet may have evolved. But if we are to be guided by the analogy of nature as we know her now, it would be reasonable to suppose that this evolutionary process was the second half of a long pattern, that the crude beginnings of life on this planet have themselves been dropped there by a full and perfect life. This is in the context of uh, oak trees grow from acorns, but then acorns grow from oak trees. Um, and so the beginnings of life on this planet have themselves been dropped. So that's intelligent design. And he's arguing that there should be intelligent design and probably detectable. I don't think he would complain about that. Um, this is interesting, the collected letters there's three volumes of uh, collected letters from C.S. Lewis, and part of the letters are uh, listed in uh, in an article by, interestingly, Gary Ferngren and Ronald Numbers at the American Scientific Affili Affiliation, which some of you may know is a, a theistic evolution website. And it's in Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith, in which case I find it fascinating that Ronald Numbers participated in this, who is himself at best an agnostic and probably an atheist, um, I think a, a, a atheist-leaning agnostic. Why he's proclaiming on what Christian faith should be is interesting or why somebody would accept that. But whatever. Um, December 1944, thanks for your interesting letter of the 8th. I can't have made my position clear. Now this is, he's writing to Ackworth. Um, I am not either attacking or defending evolution. It's neutral. I believe that Christianity can still be believed even if evolution is true. This is where you and I differ. Thinking as I do, I can't help regarding your advice that I henceforth include arguments against evolution in all my Christian apologetics as a temptation to fight the battle on what is really a false issue. He doesn't want to go there. And also on terrain very unsuitable for the only weapon I have. He recognizes his limitations. Atheism is as old as Epicurus, and very few polytheists regard their gods as creative. And then a little later, June 1950, thanks very much for the booklet. I don't see how at my age I can start making myself a good enough biologist to reply to the Darwinians. Starting to sort of hint maybe that uh, it would be nice to, to be a good enough biologist. Um, and this is 1951, October, where Ackworth has invited him to write a preface to one of Ackworth's books. And he said, no, I'm afraid I should lose much and you would gain almost nothing by my writing you a preface. 
No one who is in doubt about your views of Darwin would be impressed by testimony from me, whom am known to be no scientist. Many who have been or are being moved towards Christianity by my books would be deterred by finding that I was connected with anti-Darwinism. I hope, but who knows himself, that I would not allow myself to be influenced by this consideration if it were only my personal concerns as an author that were endangered. But the cause I stand for would be endangered too. When a man has become a popular apologist, he must watch his step. Everyone who is on the lookout for things that might discredit it. And everyone is on the lookout. Sorry. And that's actually most of the letter there. Um, and then um, in December 1953, many ch thanks for your cheering card. You will notice that uh, this is one of the ones I mentioned before and one of the ones that you may remember snatches up. I can't help for sharing a sort of glee with you about the explosion of poor old Piltdown. But I hope no one on the other side will rush in and try to exploit it. We might lay ourselves, whoa, we might lay ourselves, almost like he's on that side, right? Open to very easy replies. One, that the scientists have not yet been convicted of so many frauds as the Christians, forged decretals, fake miracles and all. Two, that they themselves have discovered their own frauds and published them. But of course, one inevitably feels what fun it would be if this were only the beginning of a landslide. And then he ends with this interesting sentence. I've never read Lyell. Should I? Interesting that through all... Uh, see, everybody's been fighting over evolution and nobody's been asking the question about geology. Um, now, the magician's nephew... Chapters 8 and following, and you can look it up, it's actually online now, has a creation story that does not have anything in common with evolution. Diggory and Polly, the two main characters, young children, are transported into another world with his uncle, a witch, and a cabbie, and find the lion Aslan, who sings, and stars and the sun appear, as well as plants and animals, and a kind of tree of life is planted. Instead of seven days, it's, it's several hours. Um, the cabbie becomes the first king and his, with his wife as the first queen, and they're the parents of all, at least initially, all children that go in, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into that world. It's a creation story. Lewis seems to be diametrically opposed to ID unfriendly theistic evolution in a few important aspects. One, they do not wish to contradict an account for life that denies miracles. He wrote a whole book defending miracles. That's a different outlook. He was skeptical of the power of unguided pre uh, evolution to produce new creative products. They are essentially not skeptical. Um, he believed firmly in the core of the Adam and Eve story and in the fall, and most of them do not. He believed firmly that our sense of morality and our intellect required design. And again, most of them do not. He believed that if evolution happened, it required intelligent seeding, if not flat out intelligent design. And again, most of them do not. Um, and to my mind, the most important difference between C.S. Lewis and, evolution, and the theistic evolutionists is that they are quite willing to team up with atheists and agnostics, and Ronald Numbers is just one example, uh, to criticize advocates of intelligent design. He was famously reluctant to criticize fellow Christians of any stripe. And his book, Mere Christianity, is supposed to be a uniting rather than dividing book. If one wants to see Lewis's reluctance on full display, uh, look at how he wrote against liberal theology, which he disagreed with, clearly. In Modern Theology and Biblical Criticism, uh, that's an essay that was published in Christian Reflections and also published as Fernseed and Elephants. And uh, if you can stand the typos, because there's quite a few of them, at uh, orthodoxweb.tripod.com. So how can uh, theistic evolutionists claim that C.S. Lewis was a theistic evolutionist? 
Well, one, he believed, certainly early on, that evolution as a scientific theory was not inc incompatible with Christianity. That's kind of weak, but yeah. Two, he believes that Christians could believe in evolution as long as certain conditions such as a paradise and a fall were allowed. Um, and so, yeah, he's an evolutionist and it's theistic. The whole attempt, in my opinion, to enlist Lewis seems to me to be misguided. Okay, Lewis specifically disclaimed any expertise in the area under dispute. I'm not a biologist. Should I learn to become one? The only significant for, uh, support theistic evolutionists could get from Lewis legitimately is the idea that as fellow Christians we should not be figuratively shooting at them. And I understand that. However, but that implies they, that they should not be shooting at us either, unless they really don't want us as friends. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, uh, comment uh, Jack Stout. In my reading of C.S. Lewis, one of the most inspirational books was one of his earliest, Surprised by Joy, which I'm surprised was not re referred to here because if my memory is correct, his realizing it, he... He was extremely skeptical of any belief in a divine creator, a divine redeemer of anything in his youth. Well, he was and an atheist to begin with. Without question. And one of the most positive books I've ever read, Surprised by Joy, is his statement of just when he, he, he personally came to the conclusion that there was every bit of a good reason to believe in a creator and a savior. Yeah. Then it seemed like the rest of his journey here, and I have not read any of them, uh, all of them, but I've read many, that was a growth experience in that situation. And to me, miracles is a wonderful climax. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's the early edition of miracles and then there's the later edition of miracles so that you can get some idea of how much growth has taken place so if any of you are interested um, at Santa Monica so I just attended this Thursday there's a play on the story of C.S. Lewis's conversion so it's, it's, it's done very well and uh, so it's lasting another 10 days I think so uh, if anybody's interested let me know I'll give you the address. So it's, uh, you could go online, it's a, but it's the play. He pulled, the guy that did it, um, pulled from a variety of his books and uh, uh, letters and things like that and, and gave kind of a nice cohesive chronological story of his thinking as he worked his way from being an atheist to being a Christian. So it was good. Um, during my student years, I um, d went to a, through a period when I read just about every C.S. Lewis book I could get my hands on. Never once did I come away with the impression that it was uh, even suggesting anything evolutionary. I don't know why. I obviously must have missed it. <laughs> Actually, I sympathize with you because uh, during a period of my life, I read virtually everything I could get my hands on, the C.S. Lewis. Um, and I picked it up because I would, things that I would never say for millions of years, stuff like that. And and realized that, that he was operating from a different time perspective than what I was. Um, but one of the things I found was that I was very comfortable because I was able to, if you change it a little bit, it's, it would fit, and you just say, well, that's you know, a place where he 
place where he wasn't exactly completely accurate. Um, and he never pretended to be completely accurate about that. I mean, you'll notice that there's a number of places where he kind of does the waffle, you know, where he says, you know, if there were any. And so what he's actually doing as much as anything is taking the worst case scenario and working with it, kind of like a marsh wiggle. I sense the the challenge that every non-scientist has in trying to deal with this evolution chimera of sorts, um, which presents itself at the same time as absolutely authoritative and unchallengeable on one hand, and on the other hand, um, you don't have, and most people, even in science, do not have personal, deep, um, how do I say, experience dealing with these questions, so they basically defer to some other authority on the subject. And you assume that somebody's crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. Uh, you you expect that, as with other uh, areas of science, this is equally uh, scrupulously carefully done. And it is not obvious to someone not deeply involved in such questions mm -hmm. that there are serious reasons to doubt that. Well, I think that's one of the things that happened as Lewis went further and further. It became more and more obvious to him that maybe not all the ties had been uh, dotted and the T's crossed. That uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff that people were just kind of assuming. And at that point, you will notice that he's still not going to write in a form that assumes creation because it would. It, I, and I think he rightly sensed that it would devastate his appeal to begin with. But he, he starts to write in a, in a way which doesn't assume that evolution has been proved, and even in a way that, that kind of throws doubt on it. Um, I would love to have seen him live another 20 years and gotten a chance to read about Lyell as well. or some of the data that suggests that Lyle was wrong. Uh, but um, well, that, well, that's what it would come up to being. Yeah. What um, puzzles me, and I, I assume his reticence to uh, accept creation, for instance, uh, was in part... Uh, because it would affect his acceptance. Uh, he felt that was incredible. He's certainly willing to accept miracles, all kinds of miracles, uh, the fall and so on. In fact, to insist on the fall. He insists on the fall. Uh, on the other hand, uh, don't go too far here. Uh, and the creation story is a hard one to accept. Uh, if you uh, at least uh, follow popular opinion, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's easier to accept it than then if you follow the scientific problems of the alternatives. And, but, the, of course, he, uh, he didn't go down that route especially, but I, I, I'm puzzled by... Uh, so that I, I, I assume it was done to, to, for, to get acceptance. Why he accepts certain miracles and doesn't others? Well, you know, in a way, if you accept... 
there, there, to me, to my mind, there, there are three really important questions theologically in that interface between science and religion. You know, number one, can you detect the activity of God? And in that case, I think that uh, intelligent design has that correct. And the best demonstration of that isn't evolution, actually. It's the origin of life. Not saying that evolution doesn't have its problems, but the truth of the matter is it's, uh, evolution is not the biggest enemy. You know, It's that attitude of you can't tell that a miracle ever happened. Whereas, you know, that's one place that Lewis had absolutely no trouble. He was for miracles, and he was for obvious miracles, and for a very good theological reason, which we'll be getting to in the next few weeks. Um, uh, not for him, but for you know, just Christianity in general. And that is, you know, if the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, then uh, you're still in your sins. Then we are of all mo men most to be pitied. Um, I mean, that's the fact of the matter is that if you have, if you take the theistic evolution philosophy, which is to say, there are no gaps, and so therefore, if you think there's a gap, you're doomed to have it filled sooner or later by naturalistic processes that if you take that position and start with life before, uh, uh, before the major part of civilization and then continue with that position all the way through civilization, when you get done, there is no resurrection, period. And at that point, there is no point to Christianity. That's just the way it is. And Lewis realized that, number one, that whole philosophy was bunkum. And number two, Christianity had a really good uh, evidential basis. And so he hit that philosophy at its core. That's right. And that's what makes C.S. Lewis even though I disagree with him on a lot of things, um, that's what makes Lewis... Uh, I, I, I feel like I could be comfortable talking with Lewis and discussing our, our agreements and our differences, and, uh, whereas there are some people that, that it would be a rather tense situation simply because they're not going to go in that direction. Comment on uh, Jack Stout. Well, uh, C.S. Lewis's strength, to me, uh, is his ability to write in a convincing manner that seems both reasonable and logical. As I, as I look back to my following of him, although I don't think it's ever stated overtly, it seemed like the, may I say, crossing the Jordan happened when he rejected naturalism, mm -hmm. though it's not stated that way. Mm -hmm. And the rest is a series of experiences that followed that. Yeah. Once you go that far, it's obvious. That, uh, was, the, that was the big, big step. And following that along, for me, has been extremely inspirational. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing of it is that uh, I, I, I looked at a uh, video which portrayed Lewis's life and pointed out something that I had not really realized before. Lewis started out being an atheist. He switched to being a Christian over an extended period. And then he, as a new Christian, felt that he should do something useful. And so he wrote the screw tape letters, which uh, are kind of an interesting uh, uh, way of looking at things and then and then in the middle of the dark days of World War II in Great Britain 
he wound up being asked to do a reading on you know why Christianity is superior to atheism uh, or or some other variety of of uh, of belief, but mostly to atheism because that was what was being fought over in uh, or intellectually fought over in. Um, and um, and he had a good reading voice, and it went out over the radio, and it went out over the dark days of World War II, and it basically pulled a good share of Great Britain back to Christianity. And that is when the British public really got introduced to him. And at that point, he found himself having a fame that he had not planned on and that I think it's probably fair to say he didn't feel he deserved. And I, he's a scholar and he knows uh, what the difficulties are in proving something. And so that's one of the things that you'll find is that, you know, he talks about the only instrument I have. Well, he was talking about his ability to see that logically you can't base something, you can't cut off the tree that you're sitting on. It doesn't work. Uh, you know, snake swallowing its own tail is doomed to destruction. And and so what he was pointing out is that there are logical inconsistencies with thoroughgoing naturalism. And at first he was willing to give evolutionism a pass. Later on you get the feeling that maybe he thought that there might be problems even with the evolution itself. Um, and, uh, and you know where it shows even more than his, than his uh, argumentative stuff is in his stories. Because in the course of the stories, he can invent whatever he wants to. And he has a, he, both in Paralandra, he has an Adam and Eve. And in, uh, and in the Narnia books, he has a flat-out creation story. And it's creation, it is not evolution. Uh, you know, read, read the story sometime. It is just clearly creationism. And you can see where his sympathies lie. It was almost like an allegory of the Garden of Eden. Yeah, it was almost like a gar an allegory of the Garden of Eden. Uh, we have another comment here, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, doesn't uh, uh, biological evolution require the pre-existence of a cosmos? Yes, it does. And the interesting thing is that although some theistic evolutionists don't want God involved in the creation of the cosmos except kind of as a... Um, others will say that yes, it's there and yes, it d displays intelligent design. And uh, they don't usually make a lot of noise, and it's too bad because they should. I think that's exactly the uh, the uh, death knell of atheism: that they have no rational explanation for the existence of the cosmos. Yeah. And no, you know, that's, it's a, that's a problem too. And this yeah. also has the same infinite regress. Problem as, as any other cosmogony. If you have a universe creating machine, yeah. then where did the machine come from? The machine must be more finely tuned than any of the universes it's creating. And 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 so yeah, you can't get you you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps because every time you pull up on the bootstraps, you pull down on your body. You know. I I think uh, uh, we as Christians do ourselves a, a disservice to to allow atheists to uh, to push that question into the background and, and 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 instead shove evolution into the foreground so that we get preoccupied with that 
instead of the fact that the, uh, the logic that none of that could occur were it not for the cosmos in the first place. And the interesting thing of it is there's now a book out by um, Steve Meyer who is called The Return of the God Hypothesis and where he points out that if it took intelligence to create the universe, number one, it's almost by definition supernatural intelligence. Um, because it comes before nature existed. Exactly. And then if you have a, an intelligence intervening at the creation of life, and you have an intelligence crea intervening at the creation of various varieties of life, and you can go on and, you know, it's not just the Cambrian explosion, but it's the mammalian explosion, it's the avian explosion, it's, you know, the uh, uh, abominable mystery of the, of the angiosperms. Uh, I mean, just the more you look at it, the more you see it looks like creation. Then you have a not only a supernatural intelligence, because it has to be intelligent in order to make it, has to be super intelligent as well, better than any of us are, better than all of us are together right now. Um, but then it has to be injecting periodically, or maybe all at once, but certainly, uh, certainly at intervals at the bare minimum. Um, you know, uh, information into detectable information into the cosmos that was once created. That is, God is not a watchmaker God. He didn't just create the cosmos and walk off and, and leave it or even walk off and sit in his, his armchair and watch it develop. Periodically, he interfered. And if that's the case, then you're pretty much stuck with a god who matches within reasonable tolerance as the god of the Bible. And then the only real question at that point is how long did it take? And so the only real question is uh, did this... Uh, were the strata all laid at one time, more or less, or were they laid down over millions of years, either slowly or catastrophically? And if you answer that question to agree with the former, you come to, whether you like it or not, you come to basically a short-age creationism. Now, Steve Meyer doesn't go that far. But he gets kind of three quarters of the way. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that whenever we have people who are doing that, we should encourage them because they may not have all the truth. We don't have all the truth for that matter, but they're heading in the right direction, I think. And that's why I am less critical of Francis Collins than I have of some of his colleagues because he's heading this way, they're heading that way. They may be in the same place right now. But they're moving in opposite directions. That's exactly right. Oh, one more comment over here. Maybe we'll close with that unless... Well, so since you opened one of my favorite doors, I just make a comment about... Uh, those layers out there and the time between them. Uh, and the, uh, the more I think about that situation out there, the more I'm impressed with the fact that uh, the conditions for the laying down of those layers is incredibly different than what we have on the surface of the earth at present in terms of their flatness. Just look at the layers of the Grand Canyon and compare it to the canyon as an extreme case, of course. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. no way that you could lay down those flat layers that we have out there in the Colorado Plateau on the present surface of the Earth. Or even the present surface of the sea. 
Absolutely. The topography is, except you might abyssal plains of the sea, maybe little cars. None of this is abyssal plain stuff, okay? Uh, so it's, uh, it's a totally different world out there in terms of those layers that, you know, cover the hundreds of thousands of square miles. Uh, and they're f- flat, and they lie flat on top of each other. And, and there are very few wormholes and stuff like that in between the layers. Uh, no, no grass, no... And uh, no erosion where you have gaps, supposed yeah. gaps and so yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, keep that in mind, folks. It, it's something to contend with that's fairly simple to consider. Yeah. Yeah. And that one has been staring us in the face for a long time. And then we can add to that dinosaur soft tissue, carbon-14, various other things that, that, are, uh, that argue for short age and that have been largely ignored. Rates of erosion, we haven't, we haven't mined that one as we should have. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, come back next week and we'll actually get into biblical stuff and it'll be fun. I don't know if I'll even get through one whole chapter because as I'm putting this together now, there is so much material there and there's so little of it that's worth cutting out.